everyone, and thank you for joining us again to Adventures of Commercialization. Today, I am really excited to have Stephen Tibbetts, a chairman and CEO of Ziva Aero, on our show. Um, a little background about me personally, I have a family who comes from the um, airline industry. My mom works, my mom and stepdad both work in uh, airline maintenance. So many of my dinner conversations were around aviation and I have had the pleasure of watching Stephen present his company in front of investors and pitch uh, multiple times. So I'm really excited to have him here on the show today to talk to us about his transformation of uh, our aerospace. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks for having me. So tell us, um, so Ziva is the company that you have founded, and I know it was founded in about 2017 for a competition at Boeing. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came about? Yeah, let me give you the extended story a little bit if you have time for it. We had, uh, I, I had back in 2003 timeframe, I had, I did a consulting job and I made, I made bank. So I decided, hey, I'm going to take a couple months off and, um, and just uh, get my pilot's license. So I did that and ended up buying a little Cessna 172. And um, what my dream was, I actually bought a folding mountain bike and my dream was to throw my folding mountain bike in the back seat and then fly in to uh, close to where I wanted to go and then just ride the last mile. So I'd be able to, you know, best of both worlds, jump over the traffic and, um, and just go where I wanted to go turns out that that my dream didn't really work out because the all the little airports that I knew about growing up were gone. Um, I live in uh, the Puget Sound area and between Portland and Seattle, there's over 300 airports that have vanished over the last 50 years. So I was kind of frustrated. And, and you know, at the time, general aviation was, um, it's kind of dying. It's dying away because it's not useful because all in our area, all the little airports are gone and it's in the gas is expensive. So that just got, you know, being an engineer that got me thinking about, okay, what's going on here? What can we do to improve it? And so, Hey, what about flying cars? So I thought about that for a while. And there's a bunch of guys out in the world doing flying cars. The problem with flying cars is they still require runways. So you can't really fly exactly where you want to go with those either. So the conclusion was that we needed to do a uh, vertical takeoff and landing. And since I'm an uh, electrical engineer, it had to be an electric vertical takeoff and landing or what's now called eVTOL. Anyway, so it, by 2005, I'd gotten around to making a, um, grant, a SBA grant proposal to NASA and submitted that to NASA um, in, in 2005, and I got two thumbs up and one thumbs down. So I didn't get the grant, but I kind of mapped out this whole, uh, this evolution, rev revolutionary period that we're in now, uh, back in 2005. And uh, I shared that paper with a number of people, including some of the founders of some of the eVTOL, successful EV, eVTOL companies. Um, and I'm sorry, it, the audience may not know eVTOL stands for electric vertical takeoff and landing. So that's, and then, you know, in 2017, um, we, we learned about the Boeing sponsored X prize called go fly. And we put a team together to pursue that. So I, at that point I knew the world had kind of caught up to my, my idea and all of a sudden it's a thing. So this uh, vertical flight became a thing uh, and we put a team together to build a machine specifically, specifically for the Boeing GoFly competition. And what were some of the criteria of the GoFly competition? Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, it was, you know, it's, it's still an ongoing uh, competition. They set the bar super high. Um, the, the, the requirements are that it had to be a compact machine. So the entire uh, aircraft had to fit within an eight and a half foot sphere. Uh, it had to be relatively quiet. And it had the, the course it had to uh, go through consisted of six miles around a track and then hover, uh, do a touch and go, and then stay in the air for a to total cumulative time of 20 minutes. So it's pretty, it was a pretty tough challenge. Uh, none of the teams qualified during the main event, including Ziva, but we certainly gave it the old college try. 
Awesome. And so um, tell me a little bit about the structure of the device itself. Is it, I heard it's electric. Yes, it's a 100% electric battery operated. Um, of course, it's uh, zero carbon emissions. If, you, if you're if you lucky enough to live in a state like Washington, then it has uh, green power, so hydropower. Um, and our particular vehicle is a blended wing body. And it's it looks like a flying saucer if you haven't seen it yet. But the idea is that it takes off vertically. You stand up and it takes off vertically. And then the whole, the whole aircraft transitions to forward flight. And, it, and it's a lifting body that goes 160 miles an hour. So it's, uh, that, that's what we're working on. Okay. And who, who flies it? How does, how does it fly? Well, like, do I need a pilot's license to fly it? Uh, today, you do need a pilot's license to fly it. Uh, in the future, we're hoping that we'll, uh, the FAA, <clears throat> excuse me, at some point will allow autonomy in which case you won't need a pilot's license. You'll just get in it and tell it where you want to go with uh, uh, you know, AI and uh, automated air traffic management. Okay. And how long in the future do you think that air traffic control would permit a device like this to fly? Um, it's happening really fast. I mean, Ziva is, is a leader, but there's probably about nine other companies around the world that are flying full-scale models. And uh, the leader, the one that's kind of leading the pack is Joby right now. And they are claim that they're close to getting cert certification. So they, um, they're making really good strides. And it's the, I think that the longest pole in the tent is going to be you know the autonomy piece. So they'll be able to fly as uh, with a pilot's license for quite, you know, right away. But in, in, in order to get the autonomy, you can, you can imagine that that's a lot more complicated certification process. They don't even have the rules yet. Okay. So if our viewers would like to see what this looks like, uh, zivaero.com. Um, so that's Z-E-V-A. Um, a e r o dot com, and you can see what this whole device looks like. Um, this flying saucer, as you mentioned, um, I really like that how it kind of hovers and you sit upright in it, and then it's got almost like drone. I want to say wings on it or or propellers. Is that is that correct? Is it similar to a drone? Yeah, I mean the the. Uh... We call it uh, motor pods, but it's it's more or less an octocopter. So it's got uh, two blades on each corner, if you will, and it's it's controlled by a very similar flight computer as you as you would find in a really high end uh, drone. So it, it's you know the the technology is kind of all uh, merging at the same time in order to make it all happen. The flight control system, the uh, lightweight composites electric motors and the battery, uh, you know, the battery density is improving almost every week. So uh, all of these, all these considerations are converging to, to allow us to create these kind of vehicles. And how fast does this thing go? Well, it's, it cruises at about 160 miles an hour. Uh, I think the top speed is probably shy of about 200. We haven't, we haven't pushed it to that, uh, that speed yet. So we are uh, in the process of, uh, raising more money and getting geared up to go out to a much larger uh, flight range where we can turn it loose and see what, what it'll do. That's so exciting. That's pretty fast. We're going to be getting places, not only skipping traffic, but also <laughs> going pretty fast to get there. Uh, I like the concept a lot, but you also, so one thing that you mentioned is currently you need a pilot's license in the what's the vision for the future is that anybody could be able to hop into one of these things and get to work or, Skip traffic. Um, we have, I mean, there's two, I guess there's a, there's basically a fork in the road. There's, we, we hope to be at some point um, autonomy, like I mentioned, certified and autonomous. Uh, the other approach, which some, some of the, uh, you know, co-peditors are doing is uh, making it an ultralight. And it's, it's very challenging because the ultralight rules are written to favor gas powered uh, airplanes. But if, if we can get into the ultralight category, that means that anybody can fly it without a pilot's license. So, so, and would that be 
kind of setup. I know that there's drones out there that do videos and and transport objects. Would that kind of be? Would there somebody be controlling it like a video game um, while you're hopping into it, not needing the license, or would there be some sort of other AI that would take care of that? Um, well, I mean, it, it'll come in stages for sure. I mean, I think some people are planning on using what what we call remotely piloted. So there were, there would be a pilot, but he wouldn't be in the machine uh, as an interim approach. But ultimately, the goal is to be have an, an artificial intelligent agent in the machine that you can converse with and just say, you know, take me to uh, take me to work or whatever like that. And uh, and then the the vehicle itself will communicate with air traffic management system and route a path for you from point A to point B, and then just execute on that flight plan. Okay, awesome. But so we're talking probably, you know, beyond 2026 before that, um, no, probably later than that for that to happen, probably uh, 2028 onwards, we'll have that. Hopefully, um, you know, the FAA will give approval for that. Okay. And so speaking of the FAA, I know, so this became, this was a competition that turned into your business. Um, did you have to get any sort of file for any sort of patents to, I know that you said co-competitors and competitors and people also potentially coming out of competitions like this. What did you have to file for any sort of ownership of this idea? Um, we did, we do have a, a, a patent pending right now. So we do have a file patent and it's uh, it's kind of an, uh, a single patent, but it's what we call an omnibus patent. So it covers a bunch of different of the technologies that we're using in this single patent. Um, but it's an interesting, you know, it's a, uh, there's many, many different configurations of these vehicles. And uh, I mean, I think in, on one hand, we're, we're fortunate to have my 2005 NASA paper because I have outlined a number of different configurations in there that uh, I can point to and say, well, you, you know, maybe you have a patent on it, but it's, it's right here. It's been here the whole time. So um, there's some protection with that as well. That's awesome that you were so ahead of its time and that it's finally caught up to you, Stephen. I really like that. Um, I've seen, I saw you pitch several years ago uh, over, I want to say almost five years ago now. So it's, I love to see the journey and, and how far you've come with this. So what, what does FAA approval entail? What kind of steps are you moving forward with now? We are taking it one step at a time. And the initial uh, step for us is to get the experimental certificate. Um, and then beyond that, um, you know, we, we have people on our team that are working out the details of what the next steps are. Um, you know, so there's, a, there's a lot of people out there that think, oh my gosh, uh, it's going to cost a billion dollars in 10 years to get this thing certified. And I don't agree with that. I think that, uh, you know, they're, they're comparing like what it would cost to get a new uh, jumbo jet certified to, you know, a, a smaller vehicle. And I just don't think that, I think it's, you know, apples and oranges. It's not something that you can compare directly. Certainly it's going to take some resources and a, and a dedicated team to get all the certifications we need, but it's not, uh, it's not a billion dollars and it's not 10 years. It's, you know, far less and far shorter time scale than that. And the adva another advantage we have at Ziva is that we're small and nimble and we, uh, you know, we can in, on one, in one hand, it's kind of ride the coattails of Ziva or uh, sorry, Joby, for example, um, because they've, they've kind of, they're kind of the pioneer out there pushing the envelope. And uh, you know, once, once that trail has been blazed, uh, it should be pretty easy to follow along. Very cool. Great things. Um, so the the device is called Zero. That's that's what Zero. it's named. That's right. Yeah. Is there any particular reason why you've picked that name? Well, it's the first one in a, in a series. It looks like a big big zero, um, <laughs> and it's zero emissions. So uh, I love that. A couple reasons. All right. I'm digging the theme. That sounds great. I. Um, do you have any other models in in the works, or is you're just focused on this this one as the baby for now? As um, we we do have another model in the works, and uh, we're always looking at the future. Um, the zero is a you know is a prototype that was meant for specifically for the GoFly competition, mm -hmm. and not having the restraints of the the size will give us the ability to be a more um, 
not only more user friendly but more efficient. So the the one that we're calling Z2 is uh, going to be much better. Um, and in the in hope in the short period, we hope to put that up on the website for uh, reservations. So. Very cool. So you're having active flights with it currently. You, you is it? Out, I saw pictures of it out in the field. Is that correct? You've done your first flights. Yeah, yeah. We spent quite a bit of time uh, flying inside on tether, like uh, over a year, and fine tuning our uh, flight computer and flight control system. And once we were comfortable with that, then we went out to the farm and, and as shown in the video that, that's on our website. And uh, that was a that was a big moment for us because we've been building up to that point for a long time. Very cool. Great, great success there. So I'm glad to see that it's up and running. And the sky is the limit for Z2, you called it, uh, because you don't have the those type of restrictions. Right. So um, Biden sets goals for 50% of new U.S. vehicles to become electric by 2030, and they're projecting that 90% of vehicles could be electric or sold, at least sold um, on the market electric by 2050. Do you think that that's somehow, since these are new technologies that are emerging, going to be a competitor for Ziva? Or do you think that because everything's electric and going zero emission, that this is just an added benefit for Ziva? Uh, it's, it's a huge added benefit. I think, you know, we're, we're initially, I think the eVTOL vehicles really shine in places where there is no good infrastructure. So, for example, uh, if you compare uh, Ford, I mean, let me back up and say Ford sponsored a study uh, about two years ago to show, and they showed what the study showed is that eVTOLs are actually uh, more efficient than, than ground electric vehicles in some cases. And I would contend that uh, electric aircraft are going to be are much more efficient in in a lot of scenarios and that's where they're going to be deployed first let me give you an, a, one example would be uh norway where you've got you know your highway system looks like a zigzag because you've got all the fjords right um if you can fly as the crow flies from point a to point b you you're you cut down the travel time but by cutting down the travel time you're cutting down the emissions enormously as well so uh, the, another example would be, you know, the Hawaiian Islands, for example, or because there's no road that goes from one island to the other. So the, the, the most uh, obvious way to get from point A to point B in a hurry, for example, for uh, emergency services would be a vehicle like Ziva. And then there's, there's lots of areas around the world like that. So there's the, the Amazon rainforest, the, you know, the Delta is really almost impenetrable. There's the, uh, uh, Indonesia has 17,000 islands. So there's a lot of places around the world that can really benefit from vehicles like this. And I think they'll, they'll initially be deployed for emergency, emergency services and, and helping save lives. That's great. I didn't even think of the medical field and how fast response uh, could be from a device like this. And so we mentioned a little bit about not needing as much funding as on the grand scale as maybe others may think, just because we're not comparing these to jets um, or other vehicles. But what kind of what kind of funding have you pursued from the Boeing for the Boeing competition and then after the Boeing competition? We have pursued um, largely friends and family. Uh, we've been looking, you know, we had an angel funding as well. So uh, we've been most successful with friends and family. And then, uh, you know, personally, the members of the team putting, putting money in to keep us floating. Um, we haven't, you know, I feel like we've, we've done amazing things with the amount of budget that we've had. Um, but I also feel like we're just getting started. We're just, we need to get out of the, the starting blocks and we need uh, significant funding to move forward. So, you know, that's, it's exciting times and it's, uh, it's also trying times to try, try to find the dance partners that want to move forward. But, you know, you mentioned some of the uh, Biden's initiatives and stuff coming out of Washington. There's, uh, there's a lot of incentive to get green. And I think that there are a lot of uh, corporate corporations that have that are in the you know transportation industry, 
that um, are going to need a partner like us. So, you know, we can, we can, Ziva is kind of set up to mass produce, uh, you know, personal air vehicles. They're compact, they're fast, and they can be made inexpensively. So that's, you know, it checks all the three boxes for, for entrepreneurs out there, you know, faster, smaller, better. Uh, and cheaper. So that's, that's kind of the, what we're aiming for is that making something that's, uh, that does the job in a, in a safe manner, but is also very affordable. And how, how large is your team right now? We've got about 25 people on team Ziva, but they're not all full time. So we have maybe a core team of about uh, half a dozen folks. And then uh, the other people we bring in when we need them to work on a specific projects for for example we don't need to do carbon fiber all the time only we need when we need a new body part so and are we viewing this as something that could potentially be in every individual's home or potentially a service that people would want to tap into like uber for example um you know i originally the thought thinking was personal ownership because i think ultimately that's the that saves everybody the most amount of money so i'd like to see one in every garage um, by 2040 but i can also imagine where you know you're you're walking through town and you you summon a ziva from your phone and it comes and lands nearby and then you get in it and you go to your destination sort of like a lime scooter model where uh, you know you just use it on demand so i can see that model happening as well we're not tied to any one particular business model, but we look forward to uh, investigating multiple business models around the vehicle capabilities. I like how you had a concept, but you're very open to where it's headed. Like you're not on this, this needs to happen and this is exactly how I want it to be, but you're really open to the way that the market is and the way that the need or want of your audience is. So I think that that's, very admirable from an entrepreneur. And so you have what, let's ask what kind of hurdles do you see coming up here in the future? You said the FAA and needing some certificates. Do you have any other major milestones that you're looking to hit this year? Yeah, we definitely want to get geared up to do a lot more flight testing in, uh, and like you mentioned earlier, doing the higher, higher speed cruise testing. Um, that's, and then at, at the same time, we, we want to make, uh, prototypes for the Z2 and, uh, expand our, our suite of vehicles. Right now we have one prototype and if something were to happen to it, it would, it would really set the program back. So we need to make a, uh, uh, some more prototypes and continue flight testing. That's what's, uh, what's up for this year. And was your prototypes, they were built in Washington from mostly local products or local other businesses? Yes. Well, actually, you know, we're, we are fairly vertically integrated. We designed our own battery packs and, and had part of, parts of them manufactured. And then we designed our own battery management system. As you can imagine, the batteries are really a key piece. Uh, we designed the drivetrain. And uh, the control system is based on a uh, open source platform, but we've we've customized that. So we, I mean, for a small team, we've really done an amazing job of pulling all these pieces together. We actually made the molds and did our own carbon fiber body panels as well. So um, again, I'm super proud of the team and what we've accomplished. Yeah, that is incredible. That's unheard of for a lot of companies to not have to outsource a lot of things. So your team of 25 sounds amazing, <laughs> small, but robust and um, very full of knowledge. So that's amazing that you've collected that group. What, so I know that you personally, Stephen, have, have been a entrepreneur or a serial entrepreneur and ran or five different startup companies. Yeah. I'm yes. I'm, are they, were they all in the aerospace or in this realm? Or you said you were an engineer previously. So were they a little bit, or were they of a different sector? Yeah, no, different sector. I spent most of my career in, in semiconductor design or computer chips. And, uh, but the first, the first startup was, you know, it was a miserable failure because it I would, was way too early in the market. So First lesson was timing is super important. Um, we we did a I did a software program for realtors and um, but the 
concept required the realtor to have a laptop. And in, at that time frame, you know, laptops were too expensive for most real estate agents. So that that was less than number one. Um, the second couple companies were revolving around you know, what chip design. And so we did the consulting services for a lot of the chip top semiconductor companies around the world. And then um, we did a company called uh, uh, Silicon Reality, and we were making 3D graphics chips. Um, when the <clears throat> graphics engine in the PC was converting from a 2D to 3D graphics, so we did that, and then and then here we are at uh, at Ziva. Fab Lab also was a you know a moderate success, although there was really no exit involved. Uh, COVID, that was a, a makerspace. And one of the things that I attribute to creating this great team to was the fact that we had this uh, high-tech makerspace. And so I formed a network around that, that where I you know, got to know different people and what their capabilities were and, and brought them onto the team. Well, you might be in the wrong space if you're knowing everything about chips with this chip shortage we have. Yeah. <laughs> you might have jumped out of that realm too soon. I know, right? Yeah, I, I think about that. Like, yeah, let's go do some chip stuff right now because there's so much money out there. But, you know, I, I'm loving what I'm doing and I think it all it all applies because you do have to have the, you know, the deep tech knowledge to pull off the uh, artificial intelligence piece and machine vision and all of that kind of stuff. It's It's very very high tech and involves a good degree of knowledge of what the chips can do, not necessarily designing, but uh, on what I consider the more fun side, which is the applications of the tech. So Very cool. yes, your experience seems to be relevant and helpful with what you're doing now. I'm very excited to see where this goes. I would be interested in coming and test flying one. If you ever have somebody you need that doesn't have a pilot's sure. license yet, I I would gladly be a guinea pig on that. Sounds fun. And um, I guess just one last question before I, we leave this show is if you had any advice for other entrepreneurs that are out there currently um, trying to make it through COVID and get back out there, um, what experience would you try to advise them of? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I want to jump back and say, you know, you want you're anxious to see where it's going next and i would say we're it's up and to the right right we're going up <laughs> so, anyway the yeah the two big takeaways from my experience really are um it you know for me you know being a bootstrap guy cash flow is everything and su sustainability how do you how can you organize your company so that you can survive you know, and in our case right now, we've been going for over four years on a very limited budget. And, uh, you know, basically, I think success comes through those who can survive. And so that's that's probably number one is just control your cash flow, uh, figure out how to do things very uh, quality, but inexpensively. And um and then just, you know, to quote um, Winston Churchill, never, never, never give up. So you'll, you'll want to give up a, a thousand times. You get, you, you know, you, you get told no an infinite number of times and the door closed in your face. And I mean, it's just fundraising and doing these kinds of businesses are, are horrendously difficult. Um, so you just, you just have to, you know, have a mindset of no, I'm going to make this happen. And the second big piece is um, along those lines is that it, you know, you've heard it, it, but it's very, very true. It's, it's not what you know, it's who, you know. And so, you know, it, this is a lesson that's taken me most of my life to learn. In fact, I think I have to relearn it almost every day, which is, you know, build your network, you know, connect with people. People are, what it's all about and making those, you know, friendships and established connections are super important. And especially if you're trying to uh, change the world, you know, it takes it, you can't do it alone. You need to build a team and you need to build a network of people that are willing to, to re to help you and uh, stick their neck out a little bit and make it happen. Great advice. Networking seems to be a common theme um, within this show. 
Thank you so much, Stephen. I'm excited to see about your transformation of transit in the future and where this goes. Um, everybody, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you in about two weeks on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Hawaiian time. If you'd like to learn about making money, uh, join us. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.